That's a tall order, but... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I was reflecting on testimonies this week. I, I thought to myself, you know, there's a lot of people in the Bible, I wonder what their testimony would be if they were up here speaking, and, uh, you know, how would I sort of um, identify with their testimony? Because so many times, you know, we listen to testimonies of people who've had these dramatic experiences, and we think, oh, I wish that was my experience. It doesn't, mine doesn't sound so <laughs> thrilling. And, um, you know, you think about the Apostle Paul, I mean, just that road to, Ma to Damascus experience, you know, having your eyes blinded, and I've seen a few blind eyes myself, but uh, mostly ones that can see. I'm an optometrist, if you didn't get that, that joke, but uh, anyways. Um, you know, and that's super dramatic. I mean, uh, what a, you know, you'd be riveted on the edge of your seat listening to that testimony. But then I also thought about Lydia. I thought, you know, you know we don't have her, her narrative. We don't have her voice speaking in Scripture. But you read in, in Acts, it's a very simple story. She's out there. She's a Jewish woman, you know, standing with other Jewish ladies, worshiping God. And Paul is directed by the Holy Spirit to go talk to her. And it's, it seems like a natural progression. It wasn't this, um, you know, oh, I've been living this life of sin and hating God. But no, her eyes were open to the gospel. She wasn't really tr worshiping God because she didn't know the fullness of who God was. But, but she even asked in a humble way, you know, if you... If you take me now to be a believer, then, then may I be baptized, you know? So that's her testimony, and it's like, well, you know, not riveting or, you know, some sort of uh, made-for-Hollywood story. So anyways, um, this is my testimony. It feels a little bit like you're on, you know, <laughs> on some sort of job interview, but um, anyways. Um, so I'd like to just pray for a minute, just ask God that he would uh, guide my thoughts and that as you listen, you would be blessed by, by him, that he would speak through me. So Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to share uh, what you've done in my life. Um, Lord, I know that you have things that you want to do in, in all of us. Will you make us um, humble? Will you make us ready to receive, Lord, the... The, the, the change that you want in us, whether we're um, coming to know you for the first time or whether we're uh, so-called seasoned believers for many years. So open our hearts to your word today. Help us to see your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here goes. So I grew up in a Christian home where my family and I attended a Christian Reformed church in Belleville, Ontario. Um, I was taught the gospel message from a very young age by my parents. Uh, the Lord used those conversations with my parents and um, sermons that I heard, uh, Sunday school lessons at church, and he used those to help me see that I was a sinner in need of a savior. My sins against God, who had made me to worship and glorify him, had separated me from him, and instead of wanting to worship him, um, I wanted to worship me, and um, it's all very confusing because I don't ever remember a time when I didn't want to worship God, but I also felt that tug uh, to, to have my own needs met above his and above the need to worship him, to glorify him. Even though I, I never, you know, lived a life of blatant and obvious wickedness, I knew that my thoughts, my attitudes, my actions... Um, at times were prideful and selfish. They were displeasing to, to God and they were enough. They would be enough to separate me from, from him forever um, because he is holy and I'm not. I came to Jesus in repentance and faith and trusted him for salvation at a very young age. I don't remember the date of my conversion. I don't remember the, morning, the, the moment that I was born again. But I did make a profession of faith before the elders and a congregation gathered at the Christian Reformed Church in Kempville, Ontario. The year was 1983 and I was 17 years old. Um, I declared to the congregation that I had become a child of God. I had uh, placed my faith. 
I placed my faith in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I was trusting solely on the finished work of Christ on the cross, his blood shed for the complete forgiveness of all my sins. I didn't really realize the gravity of that profession, and I don't think I even realize the gravity of the profession I make today. You know, I'm, I'm reminded and humbled every time, um, whatever the situation is, that, um, that he died for me. And, that's, and that's, a, that's a truth that I don't, I think if you get over that, then you have to ask yourself, do I really know the meaning of it? Do I really understand the, the truth of that? How a, a holy God can love a sinner, that, that is a conundrum that can only be solved by Jesus. So also, and this is something I learned later, uh, something that probably listening to a few R.C. Sproul lectures or uh, sermons, that I was also now clothed in the righteousness of Christ, who had lived a perfect life on my behalf, obeying the law of God perfectly, something that I could never accomplish. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him, that is in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. I wish that I could say that my life since I made that profession of faith has been a straight line of increasing obedience to Jesus. Instead, I confess that I have had my ups and downs in my devotion to Christ, as most believers in him will admit. I've had seasons in my life where I've been more faithful to him and other seasons where I have been less faithful. Thankfully, he has always been faithful to me. I take comfort in the fact that as it says in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. I come to the Savior daily for his cleansing, and I know that he has forgiven me. He has blessed me in so many ways, and I know that a part of my growth and holiness is to live a life of increasing gratitude for all that he has done for me. So once we have been justified by God, when the Holy Spirit causes us to be born again, God then sets us on a path of growing in holiness for the rest of our lives here on earth. And that's part of the testimony that I didn't sort of think about until now. I thought, well, we talk about justification a lot. We talk about that moment and we talk about, you know, the, the thrill of that, mo- that, that, that mountaintop experience, but it's, it doesn't end there. It, it's sort of the beginning. Uh, God sets us on a path of growing in holiness for the rest of our lives here on earth, and we're made alive to then bear fruit that accompanies salvation. And, of course, that's, it's that big word, that $10 word, sanctification. So my sanctification is ongoing. It's not necessarily a linear path again. You know, I'm not always choosing righteousness. Um, I have, we're kind of like, you know, split personalities. We have two natures in us uh, that... Uh, Nature from Adam is still there, <laughs> even though I have now been given a new nature. I've been born again um, to righteousness, but uh, that choice for righteousness is a struggle. And um, but uh, I I am happy to read in Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any was anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I'm thankful to God that he empowers me to live at times in obedience to him, not perfectly. And yet by grace, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One of the interesting paths in my sanctification has been to be obedient in the call to be baptized after I placed my faith in Christ. It's a little, little, uh, little complicated because um, the Christian Reformed Church in which I was uh, sprinkled as an infant doesn't call believe, adult believers to submit to baptism by immersion if they have already been sprinkled as a baby. So I finally recognized in 2018 uh, that I needed to obey Christ in baptism and had uh, my pastor, uh, Craig Ware, who's uh, living in Germany, uh, 
he baptized me in a, ba- a baptismal tank in the church that we were attending out in, the, out in Colwood. <laughs> God has used also my marriage to uh, Shannon as a way to show me areas of my life where I need to grow in holiness. Some very painful things and some very joyous things as well. Um, it's my hope that as I move in the direction of church membership here at Beacon, that I will be able to experience the sanctifying work of God's Spirit as he works through the elders and through brothers and sisters in Christ, that um, we would all work together to spur each other on to love and good deeds. Um, And my prayer is that he'll continue to conform me to the image of Christ. So I know that God is not finished with me in my walk with him. I look forward to growing in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ together with you here at Beacon. I think, you know, the church and being part of a church, a member here is, that's part of, that's part of salvation, really. It's part of, you know, how God works, uh, his sanctifying work. Is, is really not worth a penny if I get any of the glory for what good there, there is in me. So I'd like to finish with one of the most familiar doxologies found in the New Testament. It's the doxology that we hear regularly. It's Jude verse 24. To him who is able to keep you and me from falling and to present you and me before his glorious presence, without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, and power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.